Welcome back to Check Out the Stat by your girl, Treasure Wilson, a.k.a. Stat Baby. So there's been a lot of discussion around college women's hoops. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, and some of it's ugly. But today I have a special guest who is ready to deep dive into the why and really get down to business about all the talk that has been happening. But first, I've got to give a shout out to our sponsor, Underdog Fantasy. With Underdog, you can earn money by making picks on your favorite players. You can try the app in California, Texas, and New York, and the list goes on. If you want to play along, go download Underdog Fantasy, use code STAT, the match your deposit up to $100, and you'll get a special pick. So let's do our Underdog Picks of the Day. Tonight, the Pacers will play OKC. Underdog Fantasy has Tyrese Halliburton at 20 and a half points. I'm going to go higher because, I mean, he's like the main shot maker on their team. And SGA and J-Dub are still out, so I think that he can score more than 20 points. Chet is at eight and a half rebounds. I'm going to go higher. I'm feeling a little spicy for Chet in this game. And Josh Giddy's at four and a half first quarter points. I'm just going to put him lower for this game. I don't think he's going to have more than four and a half points this quarter. He's been starting off a little slow sometimes, so we'll see how he does in this game, but I'm definitely going to put him lower. Okay, so today I have a special guest, as I noted earlier, who is also my superwoman of the week. She is a journalist, host, and author. She hosts the Spotify podcast at J Hill Unbothered, and she's a contributing writer for The Atlantic. She's a graduate of Michigan State University and previously worked at ESPN. She also released her very own memoir called Uphill. Introducing my special guest, also my superwoman of the week, Jamel Hill. And today I am joined with my superwoman of the week and special guest, Jamel Hill. How are you today? I'm good. How are you doing? I'm great. And that's good to hear. Okay. So there's a lot going on in the sports world right now, specifically women's sports. So I just want to get right into the discussion. So the first thing that I want to discuss is Paul Pierce's comments on Caitlin Clark. So he was on Undisputed with Skip Bayless. And basically the quote going around, I'm sure we've all seen it, but I'll just reiterate for those who don't know. He said, we saw a white girl in Iowa do it to a bunch of black girls. That gained my respect. I didn't expect that. So there's a lot of discourse on the comments that he made, but I want to know your opinion on what Paul Pierce had to say about Caitlin Clark. Well, number one, Paul is one of my favorite people because uh, we worked together at ESPN. I got to know him there. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not trying to to come from my brother in a disrespectful way, but he was wrong for saying that. And the big, the biggest reason is that it's just not true because I know Brianna Stewart is like, hello, I'm still alive. You know, Brianna Stewart, who won four national titles when she was right. at UConn, also white, Kelsey Plum. I mean, who she was the record holder in women's college basketball for officially the, the NCAA record holder for having the most points. She's white. Uh, Paige Beckers, like Sue Bird. There's a long list of white players that have been dominant in at the NCAA uh, level. I, I, maybe a lot of people don't realize this, but the majority of women's college basketball players are not black. The majority of them are still white. And um, I think if I'm not mistaken, the number of black women who play women's college basketball is somewhere between 35 and 38 percent so the majority it's still not us and that and that's I understood what Paul Pierce was trying to say it, a lot of for a lot of men especially men who let's be honest who probably don't watch as regularly as they do watch men's college basketball or even the NBA they don't understand the, the infinite leap in skill set that has happened uh, over the last 30 years in particular. Like I, well, my first professional year as a reporter was 1997. And it was during that time that the WNBA started. My first sort of beat was covering women's college basketball. And just me seeing the evolution of talent, um, the skill, the athleticism, you know, the style, the flair, like Caitlin Clark plays with a certain style that, I mean, she's Steph Curry. She's Steph Curry 2.0. That's what she is, you know, launching the long threes. Um, she's an excellent passer and playmaker. I think that's also another component to her game. There's a lot of men who have never seen her play this way, but the game itself has been moving in that direction for a long time. It's just that now 
they're more aware of it. So I think it spoke to more of his lack of awareness than it did to what he was actually saying, because uh, a, a white woman uh, being able to dominate or being considered one of the best players in NCAA college basketball is, is certainly not new at all. So it's just that now we're seeing a phenomenon unlike most people have seen before in Caitlin Clark. Yeah, like I agree. And I think a lot more people, like you kind of said, are tapping into women's sports. So I think I'm not going to say necessarily that they're not paying attention, but it's just like, okay, I know Caitlin Clark and I know Angel Reese. These are two I'm going to comment on and make opinions on. It's like still getting into watching the game, understanding the players and what they do and like them showing their talents. When people see quotes like that, you know, they're running with it. And it's just, I think it's good that one, men are starting to tap into women's sports, but I just think taking a little bit more time to just, you know, make sure well, that's what the things have. To, yeah. And that's what things have to elevate is in commentary and media framing. And, you know, because women's sports, especially women's basketball, for so long has been underserved, underinvested, underreported, that you can tell based off the commentary who's been watching the game and who hasn't. And I think one of the next steps is that the media, both, you know, former athletes, former male athletes, I should say, be very specific about that. Uh, and in terms of what media companies are doing and how they cover women's sports and women's basketball is that that has got to elevate. That has got to be, this is now that they have something that they consider to be quote worth covering. Now we're seeing their deficiency and like why it's going to be very necessary that they add more former uh, women's college basketball players or more women's players, people, uh, women's players in general, like why they add them more to the commentary mix, why the media framing of certain issues and certain players has to change. You know, that's that's why Caitlin Clark is in this GOAT conversation. Meanwhile, if you listen to what Rebecca Lobo has said, Shanae Ogumake, me, I consider myself to be somebody who's been pretty well versed in women's college basketball for the last 20 plus years. Definitely. Like, we understand where she fits in the hierarchy. That's not to say that we're perfectly correct, but there is a lot, there are a lot of new fans just now chiming in. They're like, oh, she's the greatest I've ever seen. I was like, gather around the campfire kids. Let me tell you a story about a woman named Cheryl Miller. Okay, or let me tell, and, and that's no disrespect. Like people act like if you aren't the GOAT, it's disrespectful. And it's like, everybody can't be the GOAT. That's why it's the GOAT. Right. It's like, that's, that's what it is. And so, um, so even in framing and understanding where Caitlin fits in women's basketball history at the college level, there's been a lot of neglect there because a lot of people talking have not been watching. And this is sort of their, this is their gateway into women's college basketball, which I'm happy to see for sure. But also think that it's a, it offers an opportunity for education. Right. Okay. And so also on the other end, because there's been a lot of quoted headlines, so I definitely want to discuss what has been said. So Emmanuel Acho, his quote is circulating a lot that isn't making a lot of people happy, but I definitely want to just get your opinion on it. He said, in response to Angel Reese's post-game conference remarks, he said, in sports, you can't act like the big bad wolf, then cry like courage, the cowardly dog. So just first and foremost, how do you feel about his initial response? Because Angel Reese was asked in the press conference and she gave her feelings. She obviously was emotional. Flage comforted her, but that was, you know, Emmanuel's response. How do you feel about what he had to say about how she handled it? Well, I'm glad that you and asking me the question, which Angel Reese was asked a question. Okay. And, and, you know, to people who like I've covered a number of, you know, women's NCAA Final Fours, or just have covered college basketball in general. So what happens when a team is eliminated is that typically this is sort of, that's when they get more reflective questions about their career. Like there is, there was this anticipation that this is probably Angel Reese's last collegiate press conference. So the reporter asked her to reflect on her journey, to reflect on this entire season, to also discuss what her teammates supporting her meant to her. And everybody saw the clip of Flage like going to bat for Angel Reese and saying how people don't really know her and she's been cast as this person that she really isn't outside of the court. Like if you want to criticize her actions on the court or say like, wow, she really comes off as a badass when she's on the court, that's fine. That's in the court. <laughs> that's that's what happens on the court. Who she is outside of the court is is separate, right? And so um, what was disappointing about what Emmanuel said is one, he compared a woman to a dog. 
You like why? <laughs> like what are we doing? Second is that, and as he tried to explain himself, is that basically what he was saying, I'm gonna give a gender neutral take. Hello, this is America. This is a black woman, very confident, unapologetic, who has been pitted as the nemesis to someone who has become uh, a, a white woman who has become, frankly, you know, who has crossed over in terms of culture and like has really obviously become the most important player in women's basketball right now. And him not understanding that framing, him trying to ignore that and acting like that wasn't a part of how Angel Reese is often characterized, how she's described. I mean, we just had a huge, you know, sort of offshoot story leading into the game against Iowa where you had an LA Times com uh, columnist describe LSU as a team, as the dirty deputants, as being the villains, good versus evil, all these things. Now, granted, I know that what he was trying to say because uh, Angel Reese and her teammates have previously said like, okay, if that's what you think about it, think about us, we're going to embrace that. Them embracing it wasn't saying I want to be a villain. They're saying if you put this characterization on me, I'm going to try to find the positive and in embracing, okay, y'all want, LeBron did the same thing when he first got to the Heat. I remember this clearly. When he was like, all right, y'all want me to be the villain? I'm going to be the villain just because I decided to make a career move, the best for my life, the best for my family or whatever. And y'all want to make me a villain for, for doing that. I'll be that villain. That is not the same as I want to be that villain. And there is nuance there that Emmanuel Acho like clearly doesn't understand. And somebody in his position and with his platform should have a better understanding specifically about how black women are framed, not just in basketball, but literally all walks of lives, walk of walks of our life. The one thing we don't get is delicacy. We don't get softness. We don't get the the same treatment <laughs> that other women, frankly, receive who are not black. And he, um, I thought that, you know, what he said was just really missing the mark. It was a very obvious blind spot is that you have to consider her gender and race as part of this story because she's going to face a different level of misogyny because she's getting it in both directions. See, on one hand, she's being called racial slurs. On the other hand, uh, you know, she's being told that as a woman, she ought to be, she's being policed in terms of behavior and speech. And that is something he clearly missed. And so, um, yeah, a lot of Black women, as I'm sure many people noticed, like came to Angel Reese's defense or were very critical about the comments and with, with good reason, because I just thought they really missed the mark. Yeah. Something I've also noticed is like, obviously, like a lot of Black women have come, came to her defense. A lot of men have it. And I don't, and I'm not trying to make it like men versus women, Black versus white. But at the end of the day, I do feel like she is a college student who came to play basketball. And, you know, I've argued about it even on our show because people have, you know, different varying opinions. And I'm just like, Angel is painted in a way, like you said, that she didn't choose. You know, people are like, right. oh, she wanted to be. It's like, she has the same characteristics that a lot of other people have. But for some reason, that is all painted in her. And I know it has to be a lot. And I know it has to be frustrating when it feels like, you're fighting against everybody else, like you versus everybody. And that's when I was trying to get into that emotional standpoint about how she feels. And I think people, you know, just glaze past that. They just see this. They're just like, she did that. That means she's, she, you know, she wants right. to. And, and <laughs> this is, this is what this, this current iteration of women's basketball has done, both in, in terms of Caitlin Clark and, and certainly in terms of Angel Reese and why in this moment it's important to understand and you know, how their different characterizations have, have led us here. And there has been, and, and, and this is what I think men, and, and not just men, I'm going to say people in general need to understand about women competitors. They have this preconceived idea about how women are supposed to compete and what that looks like. And for a lot of people who haven't seen it or don't understand it, or, you know, frankly, it makes them uncomfortable they don't get the fact that these women have been playing this game their entire lives. Just like any man who is in their position wants championships, wants accolades, wants to be the best, so do they, all right? And we saw a lot of this with Serena Williams and her competitive fire and how that was characterized and framed versus male tennis players. You know, Serena, is uh, she's an aggressive, dominant player. She has a competitive instinct 
that you can put on par with Kobe Bryant and Michael Jordan and all the greats and Tom Brady. That's what she has. But because she's a woman, and specifically because she's a Black woman, that presents itself differently for a lot of people. It makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Confidence, Black women and their their confidence and their um, refusal to shrink makes a lot of people feel a way. And that's what we saw a lot with Angel Reese is that, yeah, when she's on the court, she's going to talk her trash. Yes, she's going to draw a foul. Yes, she's going to be a competitor. Yeah, when you foul out, she's going to wave by. Yes, she's going to give Caitlin Clark the you can't see me. You know, much like Caitlin Clark gave that to Haley Van Lip, but didn't nobody say nothing. So it's just, we constantly have these rules about who we think are allowed to do certain things. And Angel Reese, her sin is that she defied what people thought how Black women should compete. Maybe they thought she should be more demure. Maybe they should they thought she should be less in your face. And that wasn't her. And so I think it's been probably, um, I don't know Angel Reese, I've never had one single conversation with her. But what people saw in that press conference was her finally sort of thinking about how all of this has really impacted her. I mean, she missed a, a small portion of the season at the beginning for a unknown reason that some have linked to possibly having to deal with her, you know, mental health. It's a lot when you become really famous overnight and you have all these things ahead of you. And that's not to, you know, give her any excuses, but I think all she did in answering the question was answer the question. And if you don't care about how she feels about it, then, you know, that's something that that seems like a you problem and not an Angel Reese problem. Heard you on that. Okay, so I know that we're not, you know, women's basketball athletes, but I do feel like a lot of women in just different in industries are facing a lot of negative comments. Like, I just think that this has brought up a lot of discussion for different people. And obviously there's negativity that we can't control. Just kind of want to let you have the opportunity to give some sort of advice pretend you were speaking to Angel or pretend you were speaking to like an emerging sports reporter, somebody in the industry, you know, getting all these negative comments, what advice would you give to them about how to, you know, navigate and handle hearing this stuff? Because it does come to a point, And I think people fail to realize freedom of speech, you are allowed to say whatever you want. And I'm all for that. But for one person to handle all these things coming to them at once, it does become a lot. And I don't think people fully understand that. What advice would you give to that person on the other end who is dealing with that stuff and doesn't really know how to navigate it? So what I would say, and, and I'm saying this from a privileged position in the sense that I didn't grow up with this technology that we have now. So, you know, my teenage years, my young adult years, my 20s, a, a, a small portion of my 30s were never impacted by social media. Like It wasn't my street corner, right? It wasn't. It wasn't the place where I um, form my identity. And I think for a lot of younger people and younger generations, so much of their, the way they process the world is through social media. And I didn't have to go through that. So for me, um, I consider myself a social media immigrant, so to speak. It's like, I, A, this technology is here. I'm going to use it to bolster my platform, to bolster my work. And that's what it does for me. And what I would tell the people that, are wondering how do you navigate this space where literally there's no there's no screen between you and what people think about you and what people think about your work is I need them all to go to their bank accounts. I need them to take a look at their transactions and see if any of those people who have something negative to say, if they're listed in any of the deposits, they're not listed in any of the deposits. They don't put any money in your pocket. They don't control your pay, so to speak. You know, they don't, really contribute other than just talking like you know I, I tell people this all the time they like to come at me on, on Twitter and I'd like to make example out of folks because people feel like they can talk to you crazy just because of social media and that there is a sense of entitlement there about what they're entitled to say to you and entitled to your reaction is that you know the difference between me and you is I get paid to talk you just doing this shit for free I get paid to actually do this you right. don't so which one of us right now looks silly you probably do because you've wasted all this energy and all this time to hate somebody and you ain't making a cent out of it. So um, what I would say is like, always keep the main thing, the main thing. And the reality is these people don't know you. They don't pay you. 
The only person who you should worry about in that transaction column, in the ACH deposit column, is the people you work for, the people who sign your check. Worry about what they think, right? You ain't got to worry about what everybody else thinks. And at the end of the day, um, you know, a lot of people, uh, well, I should say this, to quote my favorite urban philosopher, Nas, hate is just twisted admiration. And that's how you should see it, is that, you know, uh, uh, I, and, I, and I don't say that lightly because I understand that if you're constantly reading the worst things about yourself and the negative comments, that it would be, it takes a superhuman level of effort to uh, not absorb some of that, but also realize social media is not real life in so many ways. Like the people in your circle, the people that really mess with you heavy, they're the ones that are around you. They're the ones that know you. It's their opinion that matters and not the opinion of people who can't do what you do. I remember one time I had to, because uh, often people like to throw out, oh, you got fired from ESPN, which I never did. I left. And they like to say, I say that like that's a dig. And what I, what I had to say to a couple of them is that the, the thing about it is the things that I failed at were things that weren't even possible for you. So now what? If you think I failed at being on ESPN, ESPN was never even possible for you. So which one of us is really the failure? And that's kind of how you have to see it. So, and that's that. Okay. Well, thanks for that advice. Cause I know a lot of people listen and I always like to have like some piece that people can take away um, from different guests that I have. Yeah. Right and then I also like even ask- anybody, I was going to say real yeah. quickly, even anybody who wants to come at you be like, okay, here I am. I'm a host on a very popular show with, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, rap icons or whatever. Um, you do your own thing. You have your own opinion. If anybody wants to say you failed at them, you have to remember that and be like, so you do realize all the stuff I'm doing were things you can't even do. Like you can't even get in a position to fail at because you can't do them. So like, again, which one of us is really the failure? So, yeah. I got to ask the argument when, you know, people say things like that, people say, well, this is what you signed up for when you wanted this lifestyle or wanted to do that. Is that something that you agree with or you feel like that doesn't make You sense? actually didn't sign up for this. You know what I signed up to be is a, is a sports show. That's what I signed up to be. I signed up to tell people stories, um, to um, hold, it, it's a, a phrase that was said in my journalism school at, uh, at Michigan State. Our job is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. That's what I signed up to do. I didn't sign up for death threats. I didn't sign up for people calling me racial slurs. I didn't sign up for people calling me sexist slurs. I didn't sign up for misogyny. I didn't sign up for any of these things. And what tends to happen, and no, it's a way of dehumanizing people who are in certain positions, um, regardless of, of race, ethnicity, or gender, is that they perceive you're leading a lifestyle and some of maybe to some degree a lifestyle they might want or they might covet or they might envy. And they feel like, oh, because you've been afforded a certain lifestyle, then you should be, then it is your responsibility to accept disrespect. And it's like, no, 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 no. You got me real twisted. And, um, you know, which I, I find interesting because I'm like, some of y'all, um, and this is obviously not to degrade anybody in that position. Some of y'all making like $8 an hour and won't accept disrespect. So why do you think, <laughs> you know, that, that just because you make more money or just because you have a certain kind of profile, that disrespect is part of the equation? That was never part of the equation. So that to me is just a way of dehumanizing people um, and giving yourself a justification for it. So no, I did, I did not actually sign up to receive death threats and all these other things. I, I signed up to be a journalist, which is which is much different. That is a, a great point because that's a lot of the things that I see people say. They're like, well, you sign, and it's like, yeah, like journalists. And honestly, in Angel's case, just be a basketball player. Like a lot of things people, like you yeah. said, expect. It's like that actually shouldn't be expected and that shouldn't be the standard because we should no. know. And, suspected. And, and it goes, it speaks to something that's a larger issue, especially when it comes to Black people, is that we're so callous as a society about the impact of race and racial trauma that most people feel like Black people should just accept it and learn to get along with it. That's their standard position. It's like, oh, you know, how many times, I'm sure have you heard, like, oh, um, oh, if somebody calls you a name, somebody calls you a slur, well, you know, you, sh- you should just accept it. Like, that's how it is. That's how some people are. No, 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 no. You don't get to do that. And, and I even take that, uh, that's not to say I battle people all day on social media. I get in my booths like everybody else. But even with that, it's like, 
just because there's a social media platform, homie, you can't say anything you want to say to me. Because here's the thing, if you saw me out in the street, all you would do is just ask to take a picture and keep it moving. So I don't want to see them extra keyboard thuggery that you might have because you ain't going to have that energy in person. Like, keep that same energy and I know you won't. So let's just, you know, let's just understand and learn how to treat our, treat people better. So even when you ask me about advice, the one piece of advice I stopped giving younger um, journalists in this business and especially young uh, Black women who are making their way in it is like I stopped telling them that that same thing that well this is a part of the job like no it it, it is really not a part of the job so it's got to be a boundary that's set there to let people know that this is unacceptable that you think it's okay that when you know I log on to my social media accounts or check my email that I got people calling me the n-word and y'all think that's cool like it's it's not cool so no I'm not going to sit up here and give you the um and let you off the hook by saying like oh I'll just learn to deal with it I'm not gonna learn to deal with it so now what okay and then last sports question before we kind of close out so I know earlier news broke that Ice Cube's big three was offering Caitlin Clark five million dollars to participate in the three-on-three basketball league what do you think about that offer and is that an offer that you think that Caitlin Clark should accept and it's interesting because then I saw even more recently Lil Dirk offering her $10 million to come, yeah, and, and play in, in his basketball league. You know what I, I would love? I would love for these same men who are in this position to just su- support the WNBA. Like, you know what would be great is that – and I realize Ice Cube has his own league and the Big Three has been very successful – is if I could see uh, Ice Cube sitting courtside at a, you know, Phoenix um, Mercury game. That'd be great, right? And – um, you know, I understand like they're looking at Caitlin Clark as like she's a marketing tool. She's obviously a very talented player, but I also need people to get out of this mindset that the only way a woman's ability and her, um, you know, or her acumen can be validated is through a man. And by that, I mean, like playing against me like, yeah, there was this um, and he meant no harm. So I'm, I'm certainly not trying to criticize him. He said, well, I'd like to see Dawn Staley get an opportunity to coach in the NBA. Why do you think that that's Dawn Staley's litmus litmus test for success? Like the moment we start comparing men's sports to women's sports or the success of the NBA to the WNBA or NBA player to a WNBA player, that's when women lose because all it does is give people an opportunity to say, well, she ain't no LeBron and she's not this. It's to point out all the things she's not. And so all that offer does is like, let's just say Caitlin Clark took it. Okay. I've I've watched enough big three games, have gone to big three games in in person. Those are very big, strong men. So like the moment somebody's blocking her shot or the moment she's not able to get a shot off, then it becomes an indictment of the skill level of women's basketball players. And that is not what this is about. So while I understand from a marketing standpoint, that is a lose-lose for Caitlin Clark. Yes, she gets a lot of money, but she also is put in a terrible position to represent all women in this sport. And for me, I mean, I, and I know we've had the battle of the sexes with Billie Jean King. And, you know, I know that there have been women's players in history that have been drafted to play in, 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 in men's leagues. Like Lynette Woodard is the first female basketball player to ever get, to ever play for a male professional team. But she played for the Harlem Globe Trotter, Globe Trotters, excuse me. That's a novelty team. Like, you know, it's there to entertain. You know, they're playing the Washington Generals. It's like, we know what that is. Like, that's a bit of a, of a show. And that's not to denigrate Lynette Woodard, who was an amazing college and professional player. But it is to say that I think we have to stop using men as the bar for women. Men are not the bar for women, okay? Women are the bar for women, and that's okay. And what is happening in the WNBA is encouraging in terms of the capital that's being raised, in terms of the new owners that are now in the leagues. The ratings have been great the last... Um, three or four years and you know we've seen a, a real sort of we've seen a real indication one is the most successful professional women's league in America in history and we see the trajectory it's nothing but up from here and I think it is it would be much better to see those same men in these positions to offer five million or whatever like what support them in their only that would do a lot you know ice cube i mean you know i ain't counting his pockets like that you know what I, ice cube why don't you become a WNBA owner or a minor league owner take that five million 
and become a minor league WNBA, like become a minor partner in a WNBA team. I'd love to see it happen, right? That's how you support women, is supporting them in their arenas and their spaces. That goes a lot further than treating them like a sideshow in your own league. Very, very, very good point. Good take. And a take that I haven't heard. So, hey. <laughs> okay. So I got to ask, my show is all about women empowerment. Is there a woman in the industry that you like to shout out that you think is killing it in the game, whether it be on the court or off the court? Oh my gosh. Now you really put me on the spot. <laughs> this is one of those questions where you feel like if you don't mention, you know, certain people, um, then right? Then everybody's like going to come, come for you. <laughs> um, I guess the, the first person that came to mind in my, in, in my industry, um, you know, I, the, my, my good, my good friend, my good girlfriend, my bridesmaid, Carrie Champion. It's like, you know, people know that we're very close. Um, she's an incredible person, a, a, an amazing journalist. And I'm just really proud of her because, you know, she has her own foundation, um, Brown Girls Dream, which is incredible, where she's mentoring young women who want to be in the media industry. And um, I'm just super proud of like all the things that she's done. Uh, I love our friendship. Uh, her and I've been hanging, maybe she's top of mind because her and I've been hanging out a lot the last two weeks. Um, but yeah, like, um, you know, I love to see uh, women in her position really charting their own path. And um, and she's she's done a lot. She's accomplished a lot. I know a lot of women look up to her. And then, yeah, there's like a ton of women in the business that I, you know, would love to shout out, uh, shout out like beyond Carrie, uh, who's who's my homegirl, like Kimberly Martin, who's covering the NFL for ESPN. I've known Kim since she was a, a cub reporter covering the NFL and newspapers. Uh, and so every time I see her on TV, I'm just filled with so much just pride and just inspiration because um, she's really good at her job. And, you know, she does and she understands how, this job is supposed to be done. Her, Malika Andrews, like, so it, to many, to to a degree, they probably don't look at it this way because they fully grown women. But I was like, these are my babies, you know? Like, I remember when they were, you know, young reporters and, and the aspirations and the dream they have and how they attack the job. And they're, you know, really have become, you know, industry leaders. So uh, I'm just happy, honestly, for every Black woman who has, and this is, you know, before somebody get crazy is like, that's not to say I ain't happy about the white women. I'm not saying that, but I'm really happy for black women who have been able to carry on this legacy that we've been given. That's, you know, from Jane Kennedy through Pam Oliver, through Lisa Salters, through like, there's this through line that's there that's very prominent. And I'm just super happy to see that tradition continuing and just hoping that more doors, more doors consider uh, more doors will be open rather, you know, that's why it's amazing to see women like you in the position that you're in. It's like, yes, you know, even though we've all been through a lot, we all got our war stories, but when we see you all's presence and you doing your thing and you holding it down and doing it the right way, it just gives us a lot of pride. You know, those of us that are, I guess I'm an OG in this game, which <laughs> it hurts to say, but it does oh. give us a lot of pride. <laughs> Yeah, because then you you see it, you like, you see that next wave coming through the door. You're like, yes, the next wave came through the door because, you know, sometimes that door was, you know, kind of shut or sometimes it was only slightly ajar and only a couple of us could sneak in. And so now with this expanded way we think about sports media in terms of digital podcasts, all these other places that we can be and more importantly, drive content with our own opinions. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just really happy for every black woman who is able to make it in this business because I may not know you, but I know innately what you've been through. Yeah. See, that was dope. And I love how you lit up just explaining that That's super, super dope to hear. And I'm sure my watchers will appreciate that as well okay so I gotta ask you where can people follow you you know continue to follow your journey your articles your initiatives everything that you got going on love to know well I got about 72 jobs but I'm gonna try <laughs> to list some main ones uh so that people can check out what I'm talking about um you know I have uh, my own YouTube channel where I put up fresh content um and uh you know a lot of interviews I have commentary uh, you know, me, me and my husband getting crazy debates. Those are on there too. So it's it's a very well-rounded page to say the least. So you can check me out on YouTube. It's under It's Jamel Hill. 
Uh, also, I'm a contributing writer for The Atlantic. So if you go to The Atlantic, um, not to be confused with The Athletic, The Atlantic, okay? <laughs> like, let me make sure I make that clear to people. You'll see all my columns and things I've written about um, as well, because I'll always keep a foothold in, in writing. And of course, you can find me under Jamel Hill on uh, Twitter, on um, Instagram, and, and also on, on Facebook. So I'm out there. Y'all will see me. And oh, I should mention that, you know, um, uh, my memoir I published a um, few years ago is called Jamel Hill. Uh, it's called Uphill uh, by Jamel Hill. And so it's available wherever books are sold. So if you want to know even more about me, the challenges I experienced growing up in Detroit and even, um, you know, other personal stuff, you can definitely feel free to uh, buy a copy of that. He's super, super dope. Make sure you guys follow and tap in with all of Jamel's stuff. It was a pleasure to have you on the show. I thought this was a great discussion, super insightful. And it really means a lot to me that you were able to take the time, sit and just chat with me because I think these are important conversations that need to be had. And it really, truly means a lot. So I appreciate you taking the time to be here. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me on as a guest. I enjoyed the conversation. And more importantly for you, as you continue to make a name for yourself in this business, it's the simplest advice, but I think it's the best advice. It's like, just keep going. You'd be surprised what happens when you just keep going. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. We're going to go to break. We'll be right back. She called this thing about was toxic. Four years and counting. Got you feeling like an option. Maybe I'm my own problem, babe. She tired of hearing, I don't know. My stubborn in me won't fall. Oh, oh. Dealing with this thing called trust. But she really thinking about She wanna be free. Away. I, I wish somebody told me the rules. Disagreements let her win, then it's cool. Even when Welcome back. Now we got to get into tell me what's up because the stats wouldn't be the stats without questions and answers from you. So guys, I know earlier we had a longer discussion for my interview portion. So I quickly wanted to discuss, this is what you guys wanted me to discuss, Haley Van Lith. LSU's very own. Okay, so she announced that she is entering the transfer portal. And my decision, I think that this is the best decision for her. As we know, LSU played Iowa, which was sown as the Angel Reese versus Caitlin Clark showdown. But the person who didn't get the best showdown looks was Haley Van Lith. Okay, so most of the game she was guarding Caitlin Clark who is arguably the best college women's basketball player right now. Not even arguably. I don't even think it's up for, for debate. I think that we all know that Caitlin Clark is her. And she's not the easiest person to guard. We've seen that in that game. Haley Van Lith did struggle a lot. And as we saw, coaching did want to keep her on her for most of the game. She was visibly frustrated. There's a lot of memes of her going around going like this because she ain't know what to do. And Shadi, I don't blame you because I don't really know what I would do either against Caitlin Clark. But this situation, you know, Haley Van Lith was definitely undersized and Caitlin Clark was just shooting threes back to back to back. So it was really hard for her to guard her. But the thing is, I'm going to give my props to Haley Van Lith, not for this performance, but she overall is a good player. OK, not trying to have a pity party for her saying like, well, we did put her against the best player. What did you expect her to do? And I completely understand that. But looking back, Haley Van Lith has proven herself to be a good player. We just didn't see her best in this game. So for those who didn't know, she did transfer from Louisville, and she led the team in scoring her junior year, 19.7 points. She was second in assists, then steals, and was third in rebounding. And she was one of the two Power 5 players, along with Caitlin Clark, to average at least 19 points, four rebounds, and three assists per game. So this is just me saying Haley Van Lith is a good player this game just didn't give her the best opportunity to shine. Obviously, we don't want to see that in big moments like this because, again, like I said, this was the showdown that everybody wanted to see. So seeing her kind of get out beat 
was not a pretty sight to see. But now it's just seeing her transferring after the game. I just think that this is a good decision for her to put her in a better, better situation. Now, I think it would be dope to see her not leave now that Angel Reese is leaving and declare for the WNBA draft that she's going to have Flage and other players there. But it would be nice to see her fix a situation that she was already part of. But I also respect her for just wanting to go somewhere else and try new. I don't think that LSU was the best fit for her. You know, we've seen it in a couple games, and that is okay to want better for yourself. And I wish her the best in her endeavors, but definitely wanted to talk about her transferring after we saw that game that had just happened. But Haley Van Lith, excited to see where you go next. Shout out to Angel Reese for declaring for the WNBA draft. And shout out to Iowa for winning. We will see what they do along the way. But that is it for today's episode. Y'all can hashtag check out the stats so we can continue the discussion next week. And maybe your question or take will be featured. Thanks for hanging out with me and checking out the stats. I'll see y'all next week. Uh,